feel some kind of way. And if I just looked, if I went by what I saw right now, I, I might, I might do it. But it's what I can't see, but, but what I know in my heart. That gives me the joy that I have right now. And that is that. He says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. That we are with him. That he's with us as his children. But when we gather in his name, that when we gather in his name, he doesn't put a numerical value on it. Two or three, two or three. That's just saying if two people come together. Or if you're by yourself, you and the Holy Spirit make the two. That he shows up, so I'm grateful right now, just for his presence. Because his presence is making the difference right now. His presence is making the difference right now. <clears throat> Still talking about just church. Still talking about what it means to be the worldwide body of believers. Still talking about <coughs> the manifestation of what Jesus meant when he said, Blessed are you, Peter, for no flesh has shown you this. Father in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Christ is still building his church. He's still adding to. He's still edifying. He's still strengthening his church. The church, his bride. He's still doing it, even to this very day. Even until the day of his return, which could be any moment. Because he values, because he cherishes the church, because he cherishes what it is he came here to establish. And through going, as we've gone through the, the series that God has laid on my heart, it's been my hope for that, that what God has, has put in me has in some way changed the way we think about church. What comes to mind when we hear the word church so that we can begin living like the church, begin more with intent and purpose to be the church and transform ourselves from the paradigm of being Christians, being believers who go to church, but that we would have the mindset that we are the children of God who are the church. And that being the church means that we carry ourselves a certain way. Not high or haughty because of our position in God, because we really don't have a position in God other than forgiven, redeemed, saved, covered by the blood. And if we remember that, then that keeps us from thinking, keeps us from getting to a haughty mindset. Like, the, like some of the Pharisees used to have. Lord, I thank you that I'm not that poor man over there. Thank you that you've blessed me with, with what I have. But as a believer who is a part of the church, that our desire would be 
to help that poor man over there. Number one, help that poor man over there to become a member of the body of Christ. To help that poor man not be a poor man anymore. That our mindset as believers would transition from having the central idea that our church our church as we want to define it our franchise church is only successful if it grows is only successful if lots of people darken the door if it's only successful if you have a list of programs it's only successful if you have a ministerial staff who can cater to the pastor's needs or whoever the guest is that that's only successful if you have a building it's only successful if people know who you are know where your building is know your name but my prayer throughout this time is that we would have our eyes opened to what it means to be the church. Be the church. Truly just be the church. I'm going to read through Acts chapter 2 verses 40 through 47 again. And I'm reading this from the King James Version. Yes. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that received his word were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread and in prayers and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and all and had all things come and had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods, and they parted, <clears throat> parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continually daily, with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of mind, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, as should be saved. Again, as I said before, this is Luke's description of the body of believers and how they lived daily, on a daily basis. If we look at this, take it completely out of context, we could easily look at it and slap a title on it, things to do to make our church grow. Things to do to make our church, our church expand things to do to attract more people we could we could we could title it that but then we would be missing simply what the author is trying to tell us simply as the holy spirit led this man to pen the events that took place and remember this here is the 
introduction of the church to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is manifesting himself and caused the men to speak in foreign tongues. The 120 that were in that upper room, the Holy Spirit manifested itself. They looked around and they saw flames as tongues, tongues of fire, dancing on their, on their heads. But it did not cause fear. Looking around and seeing that, it didn't cause fear. But they, 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 they all began breaking out. Speaking in foreign languages. So that it drew a crowd. It drew a crowd. And the crowd, not understanding what was going on, drew its own conclusion. These men must be drunk. Despite the time of the day, these men must be drunk. This must be why we're hearing the clatter that we're hearing. But the clatter that they heard wasn't unintelligible, uncipherable chatter. It was simply that 120 people were speaking in languages foreign to themselves. So that each region, city that was there in that crowd represented they could hear what was being said in their own language. But Peter spoke. In simple terms, he presented the gospel and gave them an opportunity to receive. Peter woke up that morning and it wasn't on his list of things to do to preach to a massive crowd, have an altar call, and expand the church. That wasn't even on the, on the, on the, on the list of goals that Peter had. But because he was obedient to what Christ had told them to do, go and wait for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Go and wait because they did that. Because he did that. He got the opportunity to share. And in verse 41 it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. See, so when we, when we read that verse, there tends to be Well, there's a tendency, I say, to be impressed with the fact that 3,000 souls came to know that 3,000 souls received Christ. 3,000 souls. Wow, that is a lot. <coughs> that is a lot. But that's not being presented as a standard. That's not being presented as a measuring stick. What should be presented as the measuring stick goes forward as should be in verse 40. And with many words, many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. That's what we ought to look at. As far as a standard, that when given the opportunity that Peter presented the gospel, he didn't. He wasn't trying to entertain anyone. He wasn't trying to defend himself. He wasn't selling a product. He wasn't trying to motivate anyone. All he was trying to do was present the gospel. And because his goal, because his intent 
was to present the gospel. Yes, 3,000 men on that day received, received gladly. And they added about 3,000. It says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The apostles' doctrine was, was teaching. The apostles, when Jesus came to Matthew 28, 19, and 20, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. He said, teach them what I have commanded you. And we talked earlier, previously, about what Jesus had commanded disciples. The disciples came to Jesus and asked what the greatest commandment was. Excuse me, not the disciples, but the Pharisees. They were trying to... Trying to trying to trip Jesus up yet again. They came to Jesus and asked what the greatest commandment was. And it may have been, there might have been a, 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 an amount of sincerity in what they were asking. What, what's the greatest command? Figuring, well, if I can at least master that one, then I'll, then I'll be okay. But what they didn't expect was that the greatest commandment would be love the greatest commandment would be love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second one, you didn't even ask for a second, but here's a bonus. The second one is like it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. So we have to love the Lord our God first. We have to love our neighbors. We have to be able to love ourselves. The word also says we have to love our enemies. In John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, he also says love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And all men will know that you are my disciples by the love you have one for another. But he also, again, in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, gave the command of go and make disciples of all nations, not believers. Disciples. Disciples. Disciples are followers of Christ. Make followers of Christ. And if you are a follower of Christ, you're going to live as Christ lived. Christ lived to draw men unto the Father. We ought to be living to draw ourselves unto the Father. We as the church, we as parts, members of that body, ought to be seeking to draw men unto the Father into relationship with him through Christ Jesus. That ought to be our goal. We as believers, when we encounter one another, all doesn't matter which vocal manifestation of the body of Christ we belong to. If the word is being preached there, we're all members of the same church. We're all members of the same body. We're all members of the same body. We don't all have to be doing the same thing at the same time. Think about the human body. Even as you're just walking down the street, your whole body is walking. But every part of your body is carrying out its own purpose. In helping you maintain your balance. In helping you keep your direction. The eyes are feeding information to the brain. And the brain is feeding information to the inner ear where, you're, where what, that controls your balance. See, eyes are doing their thing. Brain is doing its thing. The inner ear, the parts of the inner ear, they're doing their thing. But it's all so that the body can walk forward successfully. Your arms swing in what's called coordinated arm swing with the way you walk. So that as your left, left arm goes forward, your right leg is going forward. That's coordinated arm swing. If you join the military, they will tell you to have coordinated arm swing. But they're just telling you, be natural with your walk. But it throws some people off as soon as you put a title. As soon as you tell them, start using coordinated arm swing. I remember when I was in basic training and the TI told us for the first time, when you're going to march, make sure you maintain coordinated arm swing. 
And because I was one of the shorter guys in the flight, I was to the back. So I could see everybody. And as soon as the TI gave us the command to march, and he, he now labeled coordinated arm swing, I can't tell you how many people I saw. This is the natural walk, left, right, left, right, natural. But I can't tell you, just because the TI said use coordinated arm swing, how many people were walking like this now, thinking that was coordinated arm swing. No, 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 no. It's natural. It's the natural way to walk. That's the instinctively how the body works. When a baby learns to walk, we don't have to teach the baby coordinated arm swing. A baby doesn't use coordinated arm swing. They don't have that yet. Everything is working towards keeping balance. Everything is working towards not falling. Okay, when you watch. But as that baby grows and matures, you will see the coordinated arm swing develop. Just because that's the natural function of the body. We, as the body of Christ, love towards one another, love towards our enemies, love towards ourselves, love towards one another, love towards the Heavenly Father is our natural function. It's our natural function. When we behave outside of that, when we behave outside of that, guess what we're doing? What was co the, what the coordinated arm swing looks like? We're going forward, but it's awkward and it's not the way the body was intended to carry, but we're, we're still going forward. But it's not working the way it's supposed to. It's not working the way it's supposed to. Everything in the body has got to carry out its own purpose and function. Your little toe doesn't seem like an important, significant part of your body. But if your little toe wasn't there, it affects the way your foot balances itself as you walk. And it would begin to throw off the whole dynamic and alignment of your body. Your big toe provides balance. Something that happens to your big toe. Anything that happens in the body affects the rest of the body. We as the church ought to be operating as a body. We are not franchises competing with one another, trying to win some kind of prize. We are all members of the same body, each with its own purpose. So, again, let me go back to you. And with many words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. That ought to be the standard which we set. And they gladly, they gladly received that. And, says they continue, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. And these are the things, these are the things that, that, that ought to be happening within the body. They just continued in them. <coughs> now, I'm fairly certain that it didn't take a committee to arrange, to coordinate the breaking of the bread. All of this. It just happened in the natural flow of things. The body doing what the body does. Why? Because it loves the Lord. It. I say it, the body. Because the body loves the Lord. First and foremost. Seeking only to, to please Him. That's the natural function of the body. It says, the fear came upon every soul. 
and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. I just, I'm just now reading that. As I read it before, it struck me a different way because of how I have perceived those verses in the past. And they had all things common. Now it's a small thing. Chapter 2 and verse 44. King James, and they had all things common. The New International Version says they had all things in common. The New Living Translation. Says they sold their possessions and shared the proceeds with everyone who had need and the American Standard, New American Standard, says that they had all things common. When I read it in the King James, and they said they had all things common. They shared. There was a sharing. There was a oneness. There was a oneness to the body. Having all things in common. Some states No, never mind. Anyway, what we have when it's talking about all things common, that there was a there was a oneness that what this person had was available for that person. What this person when this when this person expressed the need, the body came together and made sure that that need was met. There was a looking out for one another. Now granted in this time, they were of the mindset that Christ was returning with immediacy. In the immediate future, almost right now, within the time that they were living, that his return was going to be imminent like that, which is why they sold all their possessions. But even this, I say misguided expectation, still led to unity in the body. Because they still had the mindset to care for one another. Because they still had the mindset to have all things common. Because they cared for one another in such a way. And here's the significant thing to it. Jump into verse 47. Praising God and having all, having favor with all the people, with all the people, and the Lord added church daily as the such as should be saved. Praising God and having favor with all people. Did they have, did everybody, did everybody look at them? Even though the numbers their numbers were added to daily. The Lord added daily to their number such as should be saved. So people were looking at the church and, 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 and getting saved every day. Because the church looked appealing. Because of how they interacted with one another. How they looked out for one another. How they loved one another. It wasn't attractive because of outside influences. It wasn't attractive because of programs. It wasn't attractive because of uh, charisma. It wasn't attractive because of any of that. 
It was appealing to who they were because of how they interacted with one another, how they loved one another. All men will know that you are my disciples by the love you have one for another. Goes hand in hand with make disciples of all nations. Goes hand in hand. Followers of Christ. Followers of Christ are going to behave like Christ. And Christ came to draw men unto the Father through himself. So we should be looking to draw men unto the Father. The church, the worldwide body of believers ought to be looking to draw men unto the Father. We ought to be a reflection of God in the earth. When he looks down, the church ought to see. He ought, when, when he sees the church, when, he's looked at, when he looks at us as the body of believers, he ought to see his reflection. It's like he ought to be looking at himself in the mirror. That's not always the case. That's not always the case. The hearts of the people from time to time are turned from emulating God, are turned from loving one another, are turned from loving God, and are turned to loving the franchise. To loving the franchise manager. To loving not putting God first. But putting a man first. And I'll be careful in saying that because we ought to Look out for our leaders. We ought to pray for our leaders. We ought to pray for our leaders. We ought to be concerned for our leaders. But our leaders, we as leaders, ought to carry the mantra. I won't even call it a mantra. Ought to carry the mindset that Jesus had that he came to serve and not be served. That he came to serve and not be served. That wasn't his goal in coming down here. If he wanted to just be served, he could have stayed in heaven. If that's all he wanted. He didn't have to leave heaven to come down here to be served by sinful flesh. But we as leaders, particularly, have a responsibility to make disciples, disciples and followers of Christ. Followers of Christ are those who try to imitate Christ in drawing men to the Father. And even though the early church, they praised God, having favor with all the people, church wasn't looked down upon. The government, the leaders, the, 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 the government leaders, the, the, the Pharisees and everybody else had something in against the church. They had something against the church because they had something against Christ. So the church came under persecution. But the people, the people did not see the church as a negative thing did not see the church as unattractive, did not see the church as something that needed to be wiped out. 
Because in those days, they are talking about here in Acts, in those days, folks would be an attitude. There would be an attitude daily. And there wasn't a push for membership. There wasn't a campaign for Christ. It was simply the church being the church. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. The Lord added daily, such as should be saved. We have to shift our focus. We've got to shift our focus simply to fishing. When Jesus called two of the disciples, he said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. And we know that a certain number of the disciples were fishermen. Peter was a fisherman. He was a professional fisherman. So as a professional fisherman, it wasn't rod, reel, bait, cast, reel in, cast, reel in. It was throw your net over the side and draw it back in. And whatever was in your net, that was your haul. See, when we are the fishers of men, as Jesus says, we ought to use the word of God as our net. We throw it out there. And we draw it in, we draw the net in by living out the word that we're sharing. Because God's word says that he doesn't send his word out. That it should return to him void. So when God sends his word out, it comes back to him. But it has accomplished what it is that he sent it out to do. So we as his children, when we send out the word, the word comes back to us. We ought to be sending it out in a manner to where it's drawing people, bringing people, caught fish. And that's your all. We ought to no longer be caught up in, well, how many? <laughs> how many? We had altar call today and 30 people came to the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. But it's the same hallelujah. If we have altar call, and one person comes to the Lord. The word says angels rejoice in heaven. Even over one. Even over one. 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 Focus on one. Jesus and the woman at the well. Jesus was intent that he had to go through Samaria. I must need go through Samaria. Culturally, he should never. He, as a Jew, he, he should never have even gone through. It shouldn't even have been his desire to go through Samaria. Culturally, he wasn't even supposed to speak to that woman at the well. Jesus went against everything that told him he shouldn't, everything that told him he ought not, so that he could speak to one. When he spoke to her, he spoke to her in love. Because when you speak to somebody in love, and you can tell them about their past, 
and tell them that the one that what that, that even what they're doing right now isn't right. But you say it in love, and she can go back with joy and an exuberation that says, Come and hear a man that told me about my past. That's love. See, that's Jesus living what at, living out what he would tell the disciples that they had to do. They weren't even present to see it. Because they had gone into town to gather food, to bring, to, 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 to bring back food. But Jesus is living out the word. He's loving. He loved on this woman. Knew what her past was. Knew what her, knew her reputation. Knew all of that. But spoke to her in love. He could talk, about her, talk to her about her life. Talk about it in love. And she was converted. That's being the church. That's building the church. That's being the church. When we can know a person's sordid past and still speak to them in love, that's casting your net out and letting the net, letting the word do the work of drawing, drawing men unto the Lord. Jesus said in his word, if I be lifted, I will draw all men to me. He talked first about being hang, hanging on the cross. But he didn't stay there. Of course not. But if the name of Jesus be lifted up, he will draw men to himself. That's why he said he would build his church. Our focus. Our focus. We have to get away from this desire to want to quantify things. We have to get away from this desire of wanting to measurably compare things. We have to get away from this desire that we have as human beings to be impressed by numbers. We have to get away from this desire that we have as human beings to be seduced, if you will, by success. What we have to do is redefine because we do, on many occasions, apply the world's definition of success to kingdom endeavors. I've been guilty of it myself. As a young man, member of the a singles ministry out in California, And we were doing a one-day conference. And the leader of the ministry was a missionary. We were sitting down with the, the planning team, the planning committee. And Go just going over things and ministries are going to be up and invited up from from San Diego, down from Edwards, um, other couple other military installations. They would be being invited up, and we anticipated a certain number of folks coming. And it was my mindset that wow, if all of those people showed up, that would be that would be a huge roaring success. And I expressed it at some point. But the leader reminded me that though yes, it would be good to have your X number of people come, he said, but the success, the success will be measured by if they leave different than they came. That would be the measure of success. So at that point, 
I began to change my thought, change my mindset about how I measured success, how, how, how I used, how I defined success. The word of God, God says, he says, he will give us good success. He will give us good success. So if I, I can't remember that scripture, I had it written down, but I misplaced my, my other notes. This is he will give us good success. So that tells me that you can have success. Joshua 1 and 8. Amen. Thank you. God says he will give us good success. So that tells me that you can have success. But we don't just want success because the world can have success. We want good success. And let's do a little bit of backtracking. When the word says God is good, we want God's success. Good success is God's success. God's success is making sure his word gets out. God's success is making disciples of all nations. God's success is letting your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and give glory to the Father. That's God's success. Because if you're doing what God has told you to do and one person comes to Christ, guess what? Angels in heaven are rejoicing. They're not withholding because it was just one. They're not waiting for minimum number to celebrate. If just one comes to Christ, they're celebrating. Just one. Because all it takes is one. How many pebbles do you need to drop into a lake to begin to create ripples? One. That's all it takes. How many bodies of Christ does it take to make ripples in this world? One. How many churches did Jesus say he would build? One. Upon this rock I will build the church. I will build my church. Now church is. Upon this rock, I will build my church. One. One body. One spirit. One. Oneness. One. One. But remember the old, the old movie, Soul Food. And the mother was talking to her, her children about their divisiveness, the divisiveness that had sprung up between them. And she was saying, you know, that on, on your hand, as long as your fingers are spread, you really, you know, you might slap somebody or whatever, you can do something. He said, but when they ball up and become one, then you can do some damage. Then you can do when this body comes together as one and each one does what it ought to be doing without being concerned about what the other body is doing. This word even talks about that. Can the eye become a finger? The eye can't do what the finger does. Not, you know, when the body comes together and everyone is operating then then an impact can be made in this world then an impact can be made in this world and I tell you right now that the world is being impacted by the body of Christ it is being impacted by the body of Christ because so many places in the world where Christians are being persecuted where they would lose their life if they publicly said that they were Christian. Where they are put in a position of deny Christ or die. And many choose death. It doesn't sound like it. It doesn't sound like it to us right now hearing that. But guess what? That's God's success. 
because the enemy's trying to stomp us out. Because the enemy's trying to get us to, he, he can't snatch us out of his hands. He can't snatch us out of God's hands. We here in the States, if we make that stand for Christ, if we continue praying, if we continue reaching out, if we continue loving, in the manner in which God has, has described it, if we continue in the Apostles' Doctrine, if we continue, as Luke described, in 2, chapter 2, as he described the church, if we continue in that manner, if we continue in that manner, God's calling card will be significant. God's calling card will be unmistakable. Will be unmistakable in this land. So what I want us to come, to come away with today is that there's only one church. One church. That's why this message series is called Just Church. Just Church. Because that's what it ought to be. It ought to be just the church. Just the body of Christ. That's what it ought to be about. 